So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. We raised in the last, in the last panel a number of issues came up about um, an aviation safety culture. And um, rather timely, and it looks like a great segue into this session, can I introduce you to the stage the moderator for this program, different to the one you had originally in your program as uh, Henry's not with us, but please welcome onto the stage Nick Dahlstrom. Thank you very much for that. I was actually going to start to apologize that you have to listen to me again. I, I'm really sorry, but I, I'm filling in for Captain Henry Donahue. Um, uh, so it is a little bit like a bad sequel, you know, like a horror movie, uh, Terror on Elm Street 2, 3, just comes back to you. Uh, but I have the honor to moderate uh, this session about safety culture, and we have a highly qualified panel here. Uh, that starts with uh, Stuart Hyman, who is the Senior Vice President um, of Safety at Dinata. Now, Stuart had uh, have seven years at Cargo Operation as VP here in Dubai bef um, before his current position. Before that, 19 years uh, with Qantas, uh, which also included establishing an all-new cargo airline in Thailand. So there's certainly room for culturally interesting aspects there, I would guess. Um, uh, Stuart also has an MBA in supply chain management and is on the board of directors and VP for the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport. Moving on, we have uh, Joseph S. Texera, who's Vice President Safety and Technical Training um, at the Air Traffic Organization uh, as part of FAA. And he's responsible for the safety management system and safety standards in the air traffic organization. He has held previous positions working with safety all the way to doing um, compliance and, and safety audits and assurances. Uh, and originally has a background in law, if I understand it correctly. Uh, we also have Asam Farouk, um, who is the Area Operations Manager in the Middle East for Chevron, uh, who has 16 years of experience working with Chevron and uh, basically a lot of it on fueling, but in many different countries, again, quite a cultural variation in experience there, and has also worked with crisis management and change initiatives, which again, requires some cultural sensitivity. And uh, last but not least, we have Vangelis Demosthenes, um, uh, who is the managing director of Trotis Training and Consulting. Uh, with a master in science in human factors and safety management, uh, has been working with the University of Dublin, uh, in pan-European projects about uh, safety and safety culture, and also worked on the ASA level with setting regulations for this. And, and I, look, I'm not going to count all the countries, but because, you know, <laughs> let's just say you have many points to use on your flying, right? So, so extremely qualified panel. I'm sure 45 minutes going to be short here, and we're going to have some interesting stuff. I'm just going to make an illustration, because culture might be an abstract thing to talk about, and what we want to ask ourselves, is there any point in talking about culture? Only if culture affects behavior, then there is a point to talk about it. So do you believe that culture affects behavior? Well, if you don't, I have a short video clip to convince you. So can I have that video clip, please? Subtle difference between Gordon Brown and Barack Obama. Here they are arriving at number 10, and uh, look at this lucky policeman gets to shake hands with the President of the United States. Oh, and here comes the Prime Minister of it. Mm. No. <laughs> <laughs> at least he resisted doing that, to be fair. Right, so I hope I convinced everyone that culture does affect behavior. There's probably a PhD thesis waiting in simply that difference or handshake or not. But with that, I would like to open up the discussion and I'll just be happy for you to uh, start off how you see uh, your own situation and safety culture as in the aviation industry as of today. And if I may, may I start with you, Stuart? Yeah, sure. Thanks, uh, Nick. Um, I think the biggest issue that we've got with, uh, with safety culture these days is that it actually doesn't exist. There's no such thing. Silence in the room. And, and you, what, do oh, you, want you, want to, you want me to actually answer why yeah. I think that's Well, that would be good, or else we can just finish the panel right now. Yeah. Um, 
It's, a, it's an interesting thing. I've, uh, I've, I've been in this role now uh, for a little over a year. Um, and I'm not a safety bloke, I'm a cargo bloke. Uh, I spent a lot of my time um, in the cargo and logistics industry in, uh, in airlines and also in ground handling. Um, so safety was kind of new for me, or, or so I thought. I'd kind of always looked at safety as being this, you know, technical thing that's very difficult <coughs> to understand and you've got to have a whole bunch of, uh, of qualifications and so on. Um, what I've learnt in a fairly rapid time with uh, a lot of the work that we're doing is that uh, it, it isn't actually this thing called safety culture, it's actually the organisation culture. So you may say I'm being pedantic and it's just about words and so on, but I think it, the, the danger for us is if we try to silo it into this thing called safety culture, then it, it's sort of, well, what about all of the other cultures that might be out there? I think it's a far better approach that we look at the organisational culture uh, as a whole. Um, I'm a firm believer that the organisational culture does indeed influence uh, and even go, to, go as far as saying that it predicts your safety performance uh, and safety outcomes. There's a whole bunch of things that influence our organisational culture. Um, if we look purely on the safety side of things, uh, a lot of us, I think, feel comfortable when we have the safety management systems in place, so we have all the procedures, we have everything nice and neatly in a, in a box, if you like. Uh, but in the previous discussion, talking about aircraft damage, something that came up uh, a lot was behaviour. And it's all well and good to have all of the SOPs in the world, but you know, how do we train our people in them is, uh, is one thing. Yeah, what does the training focus on? Um, but the other, I think, probably more critical thing, and this is where the org culture piece comes back into it, is how do we actually implement those systems? Uh, and once we implement them, how do we actually use them? What sort of leadership do we have in the business? Uh, if we look at people working out in a, in a ramp environment, uh, we can put in place rules and regulations around PPE, personal uh, protective equipment. So we might say, for example, that this designated area uh, on the ramp is a safety shoe compulsory area. What happens though if the leader of that unit steps out on the ramp, which might be rare anyway, by the way, um, but he steps out there on the ramp and he doesn't have his safety shoes on? What kind of message does that send? The message it sends to the staff is, well, hang on a minute, that nice little box of all these rules and procedures and regulations and everything that you gave to me, it actually doesn't mean anything. Because if you as the leader uh, don't follow those rules that you've set, why should I do it as somebody uh, on the ground? So that's what I'd kind of throw out there as a bit of a, uh, a starting point, uh, Nick, just to say that, again, I don't believe that there is such a thing as a safety culture. Uh, it's more about the organisation culture as a whole. Excellent. So um, we have a safety culture denialist here. That's excellent. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's play it on to Joseph from the American perspective then, or from your uh, air traffic control perspective. I'm not going to play into the English language semantics. <laughs> um, I think you said it best. I think culture and behaviors come together. I think this industry is an intensely human endeavor, as was highlighted in the last panel. And as such, we have behaviors. So you have a culture, whether you like it or not. I don't care what you label on it. The question is, do you like the culture you have? Do you like the behavior you're getting? Mm. So if you don't, then you get involved in cultural change. And I have been involved in cultural change for the past 10 years or so. And there are some aspects of changing culture that are very difficult. Mm. And uh, we always thought that, or you hear about, safety culture starts at the top. And I think that's correct, but I think it's correct from a different point of view. Mm -hmm. I think most people believe that it requires policies and programs that the big bosses put in place and that if you do that, you actually begin to have a safety culture and the accountability is at the top. <clears throat> My experience is that what's really required at the top is courage. Because once you tell people that you want a different behavior, and that you do trust them, and that you really want their reporting, and that you are really not going to punish them for it, you have to be prepared that what you thought was happening is very different than what's actually happening. And you have 5, 10, 15, 20, 
100 times more events than you thought you had. That's the courage to stay the course and be committed to working in a positive way with your staff because they're the ones that are delivering safety and doing something about it. The next thing is the people that actually deliver safety for you are those employees that are telling you what's going wrong. So in addition to commitment to doing the right thing, you need to collaborate with them. You need to involve them into the fixes. You know, they need to be part of the solution, not just part of the problem identification. And that's also difficult because management typically doesn't like to share decision making. So making sure that people are involved, and, and that's possibly the best reward for people in the front lines is to be part of the solution because they live those mistakes every day and they don't like to make mistakes as well. Yeah. <clears throat> and then the last point I would make is you need a huge communication campaign on the other end because you need to communicate to people all the pen benefits of these programs and how much you are um, making a difference by having people participate in this safety program. And just to give you an example, a couple of weeks ago I, I was in Las Vegas and our air traffic controllers union had a, um, a conference, safety conference where there were 2,000 or so controllers present and during that time we had four vice presidents and our CEO attend that conference and every single person that addressed that crowd either in a panel or in a keynote speak never failed to thank controllers for their participation in the voluntary safety program, never failed to explain all the benefits of what they were doing and all the great improvements that we've made in the service. So that's what it takes to actually change the behavior and the culture, regardless of what you call it. That is a very concise and convincing message. So in essence, what we heard so far is that focus less on what you label the culture, but focus on culture, but just don't be too occupied with what you call it. And I hear the key words, courage, commitment, and communication. Uh, which, again, is a very simple and powerful message. Uh, just one reflection because before I move on to you, Asan, uh, is that um, on, on how you word it, which I thought was a point you made, we tend to talk about that we have a high level of safety. And I, I would suggest that you change the word. Safety is nothing we have. It doesn't sit in our files. It doesn't sit in our buildings. Safety is what people do. As long as we use the word have, we're going to have the wrong focus. We think it's in our organization. But I think what, that's what you said as well. It's about what people do at the end of the day. Correct. You're missing a C, which is collaboration. It, it needs to be ingrained in the way you work. Yes. And the way you work is you collaborate with the people that actually deliver safety in order to identify and fix. So that really is a key component. Excellent. And, and how does these things play out in your world, Asa? Well, uh, thank you, first of all. Um, since I come from a uh, fueling company, and Chevron is one of the global oil companies, and uh, from fueling perspective, uh, we need to be highly process-oriented in our operation. So I'll first start uh, with the safety culture and how we perceive a safety culture in our organizations from an oil company's perspective. We strongly believe that uh, safety culture is a combination of a specific group behaviors and how they exhibit organizational values around safety. And the most important component among all this is the leadership. Mm -hmm. If leader is exhibiting, exercising, uh, you know, demonstrating visible uh, leadership around organizational values, then the safety culture will prevail in that organization. I'll give you an analogy here if uh, I, as a new employee, joins an organization. And then, you know, at the start, uh, they will give me huge manuals and safety policies, procedures, systems. But what will influence me is the, my colleagues' behavior when it comes to following the safe work practices, mm -hmm. right? So culture is basically what prevails in the organization is uh, through behaviors and attitudes of employees uh, in, in an organization. And, and the major challenge that we face in our organization is the lack of belief. Oh. The belief is missing because, you know, when we start a new, uh, you know, activity, we follow a procedure. Mm -hmm. We follow all the, you know, given steps. 
But the, with the passage of time, we tend to deviate from that procedure and that we think this is a norm of doing that process, that activity. So normalization of that deviation is basically the problem where you do not do you know, uh, everything right way every time. And that's how the leadership will come in. Mm -hmm. As a leader in our organization, we strongly believe that you need to know what are your high consequence assets. What could be the possible scenarios uh, which could pose high consequences, risk, and repercussions? What are the safeguards in place to prevent high consequences uh, incidents? And how can I verify and validate those safeguards? Mm -hmm. If you exhibit, demonstrate that leadership, then the safety culture will prevail in that organization. So that's, that's the perspective from an oil company, that the leadership is very important. And, and the last point that I would like to make here is that we need to empower employees. There are excellent tools available in the industry. We have this tool of stop work responsibility. Mm -hmm. So every employee is authorized, and this is part of their responsibility, to stop work if he thinks that the way it is being executed is not safe. Mm -hmm. And then that person needs to be appreciated, rewarded, so that he get the confidence, mm -hmm. right? So we believe if you investigate the near misses mm -hmm. uh, in, in the very beginning, you will address or you will prevent your organization from any major incident. Mm -hmm. Not investigating, you were putting an organization in a situation where a major incident is just an error away, mm. right? So that's, that's all I would like to you know, share with the group here that uh, leadership is this single outstanding you know, uh, contributor in instilling, embedding, incorporating safety culture in an organization. Very good, thank you very much. Um, now we heard some specific organizational perspectives. Now, now Miguel, as you work with a lot of different organizations, so you might be able to make some comparison between organizations. Uh, how, what's your perspective on safety culture with the great variation you have in your experience? Okay, I wanted to give a small example. Go ahead. <laughs> Eddie had Airways. If you open the SMS manual, safety manual, you see one of the pages says corporate safety objectives. Yes, it has five corporate safety objectives. And we all know that the corporate of objectives or safety objectives should be the driving items for our safety, for the way we do safety. These are the things that they will tell us how we manage safety in our organization. One of those items is uh, continuously improving safety culture. If we accept that this is only a theoretical thing that we cannot touch and is there, is nice to have, but we don't know how to measure it, we don't know how to deal with it, don't know how to improve it, then what do we do? Nothing. Yeah? So we need to find ways of measuring and of, uh, of uh, monitoring and of improving it. Yes. So we need to break it down into different, as, as already been said, different types of behaviors, different signs, different uh, metrics that we can possibly identify and we, we pin it down and this, to say that this is our safety culture. Otherwise, we can always claim that we have a better culture this year, but we don't know how, how to explain it and we don't know how to justify this better or improving of just, uh, safety culture. ICAO, SMS manual, in chapter two, they have a paragraph that says that uh, safety culture can be measured and can be monitored uh, through tangible metrics, okay? Measuring is one thing, and somebody may claim that I measured this year and I, I will measure it in another two years from now, which is good. But monitoring is something that you monitor continuously. So you expect the organization not only to, to measure once every time, but to have ways of monitoring safety culture. And it's not so, such a scientific thing to do. 
We need to find ways, simple things, simple behaviors that they can tell us whether our safety culture is, is working as we'd like to be working. So if we have it as an objective, we have to have ways of dealing with these objectives. Yeah? We cannot just leave it there for the sake of having nice things in the manual and not do something about them. So this is my, mm -hmm. my initial thinking about this. One reflection, I think there was a lot of emphasis on leadership from um, many of you were here in the start. Is there possibly a risk that we focus too much on leaders? Because if, if it's leadership's responsibility, there's a risk of externalization that, hey, it's not my thing, it's the leader's thing. How, how do you, and anyone want to take up the ball, how do you create the commitment with the individual employee? How do you make it real to them what safety culture is? Yeah, I think um, yeah, leadership is, is certainly where you've got to start. I mean, the leaders have got to set the scene, uh, they've got to set the tone, but the leaders can't do everything. No. You know, safety has to be done um, at the workforce level. So it, it's really very, very much about engaging with our people. And again, I think we often forget that you know, safety has to be done by people. Uh, it's not machines, so you can't just set the SOP and go, okay, happy days, it's going to be 100% every time because it's a machine that's doing it. It's not. It's people who are out there. So we need to find ways of engaging with our staff, but in doing so, we've got to lead them down the path of safety improvement. Uh, and that's why a lot of the work that we're doing at Donata is really about focusing on improving safety uh, and, and driving cultural change throughout the organisation. If you can latch on to what the culture of the organisation really is and what it means, uh, and then you can use a, a lever like safety uh, to drive that cultural change, then it's, it's very effective. But again, if you walk into a room of all of your staff and say, guys, we're going to change the culture around mm. here, you're going to get that, just blank looks and, uh, and silence. Mm. Um, because most people, certainly at the working interface level in our businesses, wouldn't, you know, wouldn't understand or should, we shouldn't expect them to understand what culture means. We've got to help them uh, in, in providing a definition. And, and that um, is also something, I think, to pick up on uh, Vangelis's point, that it, it's something you can measure. Uh, you can actually measure organisational uh, culture. Uh, we've engaged with a, a company called BST, who are a safety consultancy. Uh, and one of the tools that they have is a, a tool that enables you to measure organisational culture. Uh, and not just from a safety perspective either. Uh, without going into too much of the details, there are 10 scales that come out of this survey. So there's a whole bunch of questions. They all get attached to different scales that we measure. Out of the 10 scales, though, only four of them are safety specific. So the other six are really all about uh, the organisational culture. Things like management credibility, perceived organisational uh, value for safety and, and support, uh, procedural justice. So, you know, how do we uh, how do we implement those rules and uh, and procedures and so on that we have in there? So, again, setting all of that up is is very critical uh, at first. But then you've got to find a way of engaging with your people. And if you think about the culture in your organisation, wherever it is. Think about the people and think about the level of engagement that you have with your people right throughout the organisation. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we all love a little bit of, uh, of positive feedback. We're kind of used to, particularly from a safety point of view, we're used to the negative feedback. Oh, you've done that wrong. Well, hang on a minute, nobody ever showed me how to do it right in the first place. So the journey that we're on is very, very much about engaging with the frontline staff, uh, and also showing them what safe behaviours look like, because it's behavioural <laughs> as well, I think we all agree upon that. Um, so we're setting the scene for them and, and giving them every opportunity to succeed. Uh, we're also targeting uh, our leadership levels uh, and giving them some leadership training or safety leadership training. But again, you can take away the word safety. It's really all about leadership training, but we're using safety as something tangible uh, that people can actually understand and things that we can explain in, uh, in very basic terms. If we continue on that, on the employee engagement and empowerment side, that was um, uh, reflected more, you mentioned a pat on the back. 
And, and, and isn't that the risk, that you always get a pat on the back for doing something a little bit faster, being a little bit more efficient, but that actual pat on the back for safety, the reward, I think you used as a word, Joseph, yep. the reward might not actually be there for the safety behavior, but rather for the efficient behavior. Um, how, how, what, how do you make that reward tangible so you actually reinforce the positive behavior? If I can go back just to the previous question just for a second. Absolutely. So I believe that the role of senior management in managing culture is the same as every, everything else. I think it's our job to provide an environment, procedures, tools, and processes to make sure that that happens. Yeah. Um, I am less of a um, survey guy. I'm a data guy, so measuring culture on the basis of surveys, I don't believe in it, but I can measure behaviors. So I can measure reporting, for example. I can see how much I'm getting directly from individuals to supervisors, how that compares with how much I'm getting from uh, voluntary reporting, and I can measure how much I get through mining data and establishing those deltas. That's how I'm measuring culture because I'm measuring the behavior, so we, we can do that. But when it comes to safety, uh, I believe fundamentally that the best reward for people is getting them involved in improving the system. There's a lot of pride in that. Uh, the other one is very obvious, and it's inherent in all of us. The only thing, or certainly the best thing for me, is positive reinforcement really changes behavior. It works with your children, it works with you, it will work with your employees. So we work real hard at identifying positive reinforcement publicly. We have to deal with folks that don't perform well. We try to do that privately, but it's really finding ways to tell good stories. The communications campaign needs to reinforce the right behavior. Uh, having senior management highlight good behaviors and positive outcomes, that really is what makes a change. And people like to see themselves in articles and papers, and the CAO mentions it. That's how we do it. Uh, Asan, you, you were nodding. <laughs> Does it play out the same way for you? Oh, yes. Uh, as I uh, explained earlier, I think uh, when I said leadership, I was talking about different level of leadership in an organization. It doesn't have to be a general manager going every time on the shop floor and, you know, working with the workers. As a supervisor, as an individual, as a manager, and then as a general manager and as a board of director, we all have a leadership role to play. So even as an individual operator, I can play a leadership role. Mm. What is basically leadership is basically something, uh, you know, my personal behavior towards safety influence others' behavior, right? So how I influence others is basically a part of leadership. And, and for me, I think uh, we talked about empowering employees. That, that's very important. And I'll give you a more objective examples here. Like uh, we, have, uh, we have a lot of safety drives, initiatives, and processes where we make employees as the sponsor of that process. Mm. We make custodian of that process to a specific employee, and we call it, he's the sponsor of motor vehicle safety, of safe work practices, investigation, incident investigation and reporting, and so on and so forth. So you are just giving that confidence to the employees that, look, you are the custodian ownership, and we would like to see your leadership around that process, how you are going to implement that in your work group. So that's how we are giving empowerment and, you know, that custodianship, that buy-in to the employees. Excellent. Um, Vangelis, then again, coming back, um, you must certainly have more examples of different organizations. We can all say empowerment, we can all talk about engagement, but, but what is that you actually do to get it? Again, if I can speak with examples. Sure, go <laughs> yes. ahead. Uh, one example that I have uh, is, um, for ex last week I was in Canada, I was with uh, Rolls Royce, uh, the aero engines company there. I was there uh, uh, for the last uh, three, four years. And uh, okay, I, I wouldn't like to talk about the negative things, but I want to say the different things. So uh, the improvement. I, I, I had a training with the managers on SMS, 
and the president of the company was there, and he had the biggest participation in, in the training. Yes? For me, this is something that sends a very strong message to, all, to the rest. And he, through the training, he made some serious decisions of how things are moving forward. And this kind of leadership was also reflected to the fact that the, through the previous days of training, a lot of people gave a lot of ideas that these ideas were addressed by the management and some decisions were taken on the spot. So uh, th this is one example. Another example is uh, uh, to go to the little ones. We, I was working f with Fujera Aviation in, uh, in Fujera in, in UAE. Uh, Aviation Academy, they had um, a number of reports two years ago. They were something like uh, five per month. Now they have something like uh, 300 per month. Mm. Yeah. And this is not a result only of uh, the training that we deliver, but you can see the different culture that moves from the top goes to the bottom. The way we handle the reports when they arrived the way they treat the people who made errors. So all of these different types of behavior, they reflected in this number of reports and the actions that the organization is taking and encouraging the rest of the people to report. So all of these are little things, but important things in order to, to uh, encourage uh, improvement of the safety culture. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, gentlemen here on the stage, time is passing incredibly quick and I really do want to give the chance for more than one question. So can I have some questions from the floor? Yes, I, I would have thought so, excellent. <laughs> um, yep. Yes. <laughs> I, I understand it in its positive effect to be um, basically professionalism uh, and really um, nothing more than that. And I think that it's, um, uh, it has a good and positive influence. And I say that because what I, what I think is more interesting is the small area in which it is not a good thing. And the ways in which, well, we see in a, in a pilot association safety culture being not good is when it becomes a substitute for some sort of more substantive safety practice. So in other words, there would be an honest way of addressing a safety issue, but you know it's too honest. So we'll use some vague uh, evocation, some vague ambition of safety culture, and that will, that will deal with it. Um, so it, in some areas, it's, it can be naive. And I think that for you know, generally speaking, when I, when I come along to, to uh, discussions on it, um, there's a very, um, you know, you're, the, the community is one of believers, but I think we need a few more um, critics and not so many cheerleaders uh, around it. And All I right. Guess, I guess, it, the, you know, the technical work we do in the pilot association is often to defend pilots when there have been some really spectacular uh, failings of safety culture and they can be silenced in discussing it because of, comp the, you know, they're bound into confidentiality agreements and things like that. So if I understand that right, how can safety culture be problematic uh, and, and even at time obscure actual safety issues? Uh, that's uh, quite a challenging question. Anyone want to try that one? Um, I would just have a bit of a crack and, and come back to what I said earlier, that I think in that example, it's, it's possibly to me more about the organisational culture. Um, I can understand being silenced from a <laughs> confidentiality point of view, but the silencing often also comes from um, what the consequences might be. Um, and yeah, behaviours are driven by consequences. Whether we know we're doing it or not, you know, often we, we're subconsciously thinking about, well, hang on, if I go right, what's going to happen? If I go left, what's going to happen? Um, and human nature tends to steer us towards a consequence that's going to give us a positive effect um, or a positive outcome. So again, you know, that sort of issue where you may not be, uh, where, where you have a, a culture that uh, encourages cover up and so on, um, may actually be more a factor of the, the organisational uh, culture itself. 
If I may respond as well, it, it reminds me, I was talking for helicopter operations um, a couple of years ago for the WFP, which of course is extremely risky operations. There is another risk. We, we can certainly think about the organizational culture and the risk of punishment and so that's the most obvious discussion. But the interesting thing with these, I made the argument with these helicopter operators that the problem is that they've already accepted and internalized those risks. It becomes a problem to change a safety culture when you see it as a pride that I risk my life every day. I do, I fly under this thing and through the mountains and that's why I'm a good pilot. So now you have made what is really a risk that should be handled, something at the pride of your profession instead. And then it's getting very difficult to change. So th that that's would be one reflection from my side. Anything else? Yes, I... <clears throat> This is going to seem like a defensive answer, but I hope it's not taken that way. So if I were to define safety culture as doing the right thing, even when no one is looking, mm. and you did something wrong unexpectedly, and you report that, I mean, that's what we want. So that we all learn from that unintended consequence. Also, um, part of this culture creates a lot of reporting, and it's really judge us on what we do with that information because I don't know what I don't know and I'm never going to act on what I don't know. So to me, it's all good if I do know. So I have confidential information sharing programs with airlines, for example, where we sit down with airlines and share confidential data because oftentimes we think the other side is the problem. So being able to arrive at better decisions, uh, oftentimes we know that it really isn't either one of us. The, we got a problem with the avionics certification. We get to get those people on board. So I don't know how a safety in a reporting culture could be bad, unless we have the labels wrong of what we're calling things. But I'm certainly being held accountable to do a lot more than I ever did before in terms of identifying real issues and cooperating across stakeholders, not just with my own employees to find better solutions. Uh, and, and I think that's all good. So just a different view. We have a few other questions. Well, I guess it's the lottery who's going to get the microphone. I don't, I'm not deciding that. Don't look at me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> um, you've been talking about safety culture and uh, its positive effect within an organization. And an SMS, um, is essentially based within an organization, but they are now mandated. Uh, and therefore, um, although good companies, in inverted commas, will uh, have the motivation themselves to develop and implement a functioning, uh, effective SMS, there are some companies that perhaps either don't want, don't, aren't convinced, um, or who just don't have the uh, ability to implement a good SMS for themselves. Um, it, I think it's always a challenge for the regulator to de decide whether an SMS is a functioning SMS or not. Do the panel and, and any regulators in the room have any advice as to how you, from the outside, determine whether a reporting system, the subsequent analysis, the actions, implementation, and then the review that circle of a good SMS, whether it is working within an organization or whether there are just some fine words in the operations manual that actually are there for window dressing. Well, given that uh, Vangelis has worked with the ASA and so on, I would pass on the question to you on this. Thank you. I guess uh, we need to be a little bit practical sometimes when it comes to SMS. And uh, I like also the simple approach. What is the SMS about? The SMS is to manage our risks, yes? So if we want to find out whether they have an effective <coughs> SMS, we want to see whether, first of all, they have a good way of identifying the hazards in the organization. Do they implement different processes in order to know what are the hazards of the organization? Yes? And if we talk about culture, do we have the participation of the different stakeholders, including everybody in this? The second one, do they identify what are the biggest risks and do they, do, do they manage these risks? 
or they just do some risk assessment for the sake of doing some risk assessment and show to the authorities. So is this risk assessment that you have performed the, your biggest risk of the organization? So this is the second question I would ask. The third question is I would ask about the safety assurance, as it is called on the, the safety assurance is a way of knowing whether these measures that we have taken are working. Yes? And we can do this through different things. We can do it with safety performance indicators. We can um, do it by uh, looking at the data that the, uh, re the um, reports are telling us, by doing some surveys of the people, by doing some observations. So we have different means of assuring, of making sure that all the measures that we have taken are actually working. Yes? So this is the third simple thing. And the fourth sim simple thing that we have to do is whether the management of the organization is sitting down, reviewing this data, and making sure that what is the next step? How do we improve from here? Yes? So these are the four items that I would look to see if we have an effective system. That's a four-point program as a response. Very good. Uh, we are unfortunately pretty much out of time. So I can only encourage those people who had their hands in the air to follow up, hunt down, stalk, and completely terrorize the people on this stage until you get the answers you want um, um, as soon as this uh, session is over. I'd just like to finish up with a little bit of a surprise challenge to my fellow panelists. And you don't have to take this up. What I would challenge you to use one or a few words, maximum a sentence, uh, to make a final statement about safety culture and what terms you think it, it's important. You ready for that, Stuart? A couple of words. Go out there and engage with your people. Nice one. Joe? Even though SMS is now required by ICAO, I tend to sympathize with the last question. States need to provide a different way to regulate other than compliance and they need to protect the information gathered. That work needs to be done by a lot of states, including mine. Excellent, awesome. I would say leaders demonstrate visible leadership around the organizational values of safety and lead from the front. I would say that uh, values, we need to revisit our values, make our values visible, make the values uh, monitored and uh, applied on a daily basis. Excellent, and I'll pitch in last that with create curiosity. In an organization with a curiosity about error, people will learn and people will be safe. But if they can't be curious, there's gonna be no safety. Thank you very much to my fellow panelists and thank you to everyone.